This is the story of an American business that was worth billions and went bankrupt because of shady business dealings. I'm sure you're thinking, which one? Well, I'm not talking about Theranos or WeWork. No, the story I'm telling actually happened two decades ago. And it's one of the biggest corporate bankruptcies in U.S. history with over $63 billion in losses. However, all of these companies seem to share the same tragic flaw, and that's greed. This is the story of Enron and just how corrupt they actually were. Like, just wait, you'll be shocked. So first, just a little bit about Enron. Don't worry, I'm not going to go too much into what they did because it's really confusing and most of it is smoke and mirrors. But the important things to know is that Enron were the darlings of Wall Street. They were always in the green, they had Bernie Madoff sort of gains, and other companies just could not seem to crack the code to Enron's formula for success. And Enron's response to this was always, you're just not smart enough or something to that effect. And their motto, ask why. And they actually wanted to change the world. And that's an incredibly seductive dream to sell. It's the same dream that Theranos and WeWork sold. So the reason why people couldn't crack Enron's code to success wasn't because they weren't smart enough. It was because they were making a series of unethical and straight up illegal decisions all for the sake of money. And it worked for a long time. They made a lot of money. Next, let me introduce you to our cast of characters and who made all of this possible. So these are the major players. So this guy first, this is Kenneth Lay. He is the founder and CEO of Enron. Some fun facts about him is that he has very close ties to the Bush family and contributed to George W. Bush's campaign, um, was the largest donor actually, and he is largely responsible for deregulating the energy sector. Now this guy, this is Jeffrey Skilling. He was the mastermind behind Enron, kind of like the Steve Jobs of Enron. He was on a mission to make Enron billions of dollars and would do anything to get there. He kind of created a Darwinian culture at Enron, like kill or be killed. He believed in raiding his employees and getting rid of anyone who didn't meet a certain quota. So you better figure out a way to make money for the company you're privileged enough to work for. To be continued in part two. This is the story of a billion dollar business that went bankrupt because of shady business dealings. Part two. This is the story of Enron. I highly recommend watching part one to catch up. So to pick up where we left off, we were talking about Jeffrey Skilling and the cutthroat work environment he created. This was before a toxic work environment was a thing. He also found a way to make Enron billions. And that was by using an accounting trick called Mark to Market. In and of itself, it's not a bad thing, but the way Enron was doing it was bad. The way Enron was doing it, so for example, if they were to sign a five-year contract and they were supposed to make $5 million off of those five years, awesome. But instead of marking it over the long-term five years, they marked down that they made $5 million that day. So their numbers looked great on paper. Even deals that fell through would be marked down as profitable. For example, they had a bandwidth deal with Blockbuster to do streaming services. The tech wasn't there though, so the deal fell through, but they recorded the projected profits as a win. They built a power plant in India, but the whole project and the building had to be abandoned because the country couldn't afford to run the electricity. But according to the books, this was a huge success. They did other illegal things to meet their quarterly goals, too. Like they had Merrill Lynch buy a couple of Nigerian barges that they owned, only for them to sell it right back to Enron the next quarter. They wound up getting caught for this, and Merrill Lynch was actually prosecuted. They were a trading company, too, and that was just as shady. Most of it was just cooked books. It even got to the point where they were trading weather. But again, you're just not smart enough to get it. What's particularly vile, though, is when they merged with Pacific Gas and Electric in California, which gave them access to California's energy grid. 
and rolling blackouts mysteriously started to happen. Basically what they would do is they would shut down sectors of energy in random areas. They would create a demand for electricity and since the demand was so high, they could charge whatever they wanted. And they did this for years. The reason they got away with this for so long is for a couple of reasons. The first one being, Kenneth Lay managed to get the energy sector in California deregulated so they could do whatever they wanted. And the second reason being, California's energy crisis was ruled to be a federal issue, and guess who was in charge of the federal government at the time? None other than Kenny Boy's good friend, George Bush. I will wrap it up in part three, I promise. This is the story of one of the most corrupt corporations ever. Part three. This is the story of Enron. Watch parts one and two to catch up. So we talked about their disgusting business practices, and we talked about the two men who ran the business. But how did they make it look good on paper? This man, actually, his name is Andrew Fastow, and he was the CFO of the company. And he was like a magician at cooking the books. He actually bought a company that would just buy debt and assets and sell them to Enron just to make Enron a profit. You can't say he wasn't dedicated. Anyway. This is Bethany McLean, and she is a journalist who was doing a piece on Enron. And when she did some investigating, she kept coming up with the same question. How is Enron making their money? She contacted the CEO, Jeffrey Skilling, for an answer. And this is what he said. I'm not an accountant, so I can't tell you that. It should be pretty straightforward, right? Like You have a service, people pay you for it. He put her in touch with him, and he couldn't answer her questions very well either. A few years later, Jeffrey resigns from Enron. He leaves with millions, and Ken Lay takes over. A whistleblower within the company notified Ken Lay about the illegal things she's noticed the CFO doing, assuming he didn't already know. So before he left the company, he encouraged all the employees to invest their 401k into the company, even though he knew they were going into the red. And he tried to assure his employees and the investors that the company was fine. Meanwhile, they're having their accounting firm, the oldest accounting firm in America, by the way, shred a ton of documents for them. And when I say a ton, I don't mean a lot. I mean literally 2,000 pounds of paper. Apparently, it wasn't enough shredding. And the Wall Street Journal published an article about the CFO's illegal dealings, and a formal investigation was launched by the SEC. And the fallout was catastrophic. Enron's market price was frozen at $32, and when it reopened, it was at $9. And they were bankrupt within a month. The executives had a fire sale before this happened, so a lot of them made millions. But 20,000 Enron employees lost their jobs, health insurance, with an average severance pay of $4,500. And kind of a weird thing happened. The men were held accountable. Ken Lay was convicted of securities fraud, but passed away before he could be sentenced. Gilling was convicted on 19 counts and sentenced to 24 years and served 12. And he was sentenced to six years in prison. And that's the short story of how a series of greedy decisions brought down Enron.